good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Picture House Central, this incredible event, of course, very exciting on so many levels. For me, the first event that I've hosted live since February 2022, a distant time, of course, for all of us before the pandemic. We're now in a different stage of the pandemic. Of course, COVID, it looks like, will stay with us um, for some time to come, but arguably not as long as the moon and the sledgehammer has stayed with us. We're on the 50th anniversary screening of this extraordinary documentary about which I will say very little, of course, in advance because it speaks more than wonderfully for itself. And we have an extraordinary lineup of moon and sledgehammer related talent for you uh, which i will uh, bring to your attention very shortly my name is gareth evans i'm holding a circular piece of paper today a piece of card from yesterday's pizza this is literally the base of yesterday's vegan pizza i'm not vegan but of course we're looking to be vegan uh, in the coming period of course um, to save the planet to save much else besides now i'm using this piece of cardboard for three reasons one because it's circular of course and we're coming full circle over 50 years uh, with this film and also particularly with one of our guests, which I'll mention shortly in relation to coming full circle. It's also a lunar shape. It's moon shaped. Of course, that relates directly to the title, but also to the moment of filming, which if you haven't seen the moon and the sledgehammer will reveal itself during the course of the program. But also particularly, of course, because I'm reusing something. I'm using something that was previously used for something else and is now uh, taking uh, my notes forward into the Q&A session afterwards. So hopefully I'm embodying the spirit of the film as well as as holding a piece of used cardboard. Many thanks indeed to everyone at Picture House Central, of course, for making this particular screening possible. As I said, there have been a number of anniversary screenings uh, over the years since the film was premiered at the Berlin Film Festival in 1971. And in recent years, we have no one that we should thank more than Katie McMillan for keeping this film uh, central uh, to the film culture and to the wider culture, because this is a film that has had influence well beyond um, the uh, realm of documentary, although it remains one of the most loved British documentaries of all time. It has spoken to many, many people and many generations since its making on all sorts of fronts because it deals headlong, but in the wittiest and most poetic of ways, with some of the key questions facing us today. Facing us since the 70s, of course, a particular decade in which certain uh, questions were raised, arguably um, uh, in the public population, the wider population for the first time, but now are absolutely central. How do we live? Where do we live? How do we think about our locality? How do we think about our relationship to the wider world? How how do we find meaning? How do we relate to time? How do we relate to each other? Now, these, are, of course, are all questions that have come uh, to the uh, front and center of our lives in the last 18 months or so, but absolutely continue um, to remain central given the ecological crisis we find ourselves in and much else besides. So much to talk about. Many thanks to those of you who have put questions uh, to us in advance. I have those on a rectangular piece of paper in my inside pocket, and I will use both pieces, of course, uh, come the Q&A, which I am delighted uh, to be hosting uh, alongside Philip Trevelyan, the remarkable director, uh, organic farmer and organic miller. Uh, more on that, of course, in the conversation. Uh, the filmmaker, um, we have to thank more than anyone else, of course, for making uh, this event possible. And also, of course, two wonderful guests across uh, generations speaking to and from the film in ways um, that reveal their passion and commitment to this work. John Russell Taylor, who was at the very first screening, the wonderful writer, critic across all art forms, and the authorised biographer uh, and friend of Alfred Hitchcock, among much else. John Russell Taylor was in that first screening at the Berlin Film Festival in 1971 and filed a report a uh, review for the British press. Um, so he has seen the film um, travel across all those decades uh, and obviously seen how it has spoken to the changing times, both in Britain and internationally, as well as filmically, of course. And we're also equally delighted that Maxine Peake, who of course needs no introduction to any of you, is here a passionate advocate of the film. She chose the film as one of her desert island docks at the Sheffield Dock Fest. We'll hear more on that, I'm sure, in the conversation. And she, of course, um, will tell you um, in, uh, in her wonderful way about why the film is important to her and to our times as well. So much to talk about. We've got, obviously, a lot to get through. Um, do please uh, feel free to add questions to the list that I have, of course, uh, when the conversational moment arrives. But like I said, many thanks to all our wonderful guests, to Katie, to Picture House Central, and of course to Philip for making the film. Delighted, of course, also to announce that at the same time as this right now, in fact, across the border in Scotland, soon perhaps to be an independent nation, uh, more on that uh, on another day. Um, but uh, in Scotland right now, on the banks of the Clyde, there is a screening of the Moon and the Sledgehammer, a sister screening, in an extraordinary site, uh, an abandoned um, ship factory on, on the banks of the Clyde, where they are currently... Um, 
and putting a final uh, assembly to a carpenter, carpentered, if that's a word, uh, made from the carpenter's skills, a uh, wall of death. A wall of death, of course, the old um, popular pastime of the 1920s or so, uh, up into the 50s, I believe. Uh, the wall of death, the motorbiking wall of death. But this wall of death has been made over lockdown, unfunded completely, um, supported by many, many people, um, but not in the conventional way. Very much a, a project in the spirit of the Moon and the Sledgehammer. But crucially, this wall of death is made without any nails. It's just made with the extraordinary joinery of the uh, many talents involved. And this wall of death will be touring Scotland um, in the coming months, doing what walls of death do, which, of course, is put someone on a motorbike um, at uh, the wrong angle in relation to the ground and watch them as they circle um, the said piece of carpentry. The fact is that there's no nails in it means that it can be transported, of course, in the spirit of old walls of death. So if you find yourself in Scotland, Scotland in the near future, keep an eye out for the wall of death and find your way to the banks of the Clyde, which sounds like a folk song that I wish I'd written, but I have no musical skills, and that's why I'm going to pass the music of this film on to you now by looking um, at the screen behind me. We are moving away from my talking, thank the Lord, and we are now moving to the moon and the sledgehammer. Thank you very much. Thank you all very, very much indeed. Special, special thanks to you, Philip. And we'll start with you, if we may. There's all sorts of questions that the film raises, and you give us a huge amount of space to think about those questions as the film unfolds. Social, emotional, philosophical, practical questions. Now, uh, um, on the question sheet I have here, um, a number of those questions are raised, and I won't ask you those directly now. But what I would like to ask you is, when you were filming this, you were uh, in your mid-twenties, you were much closer in age to the children of Mr. Page rather than Mr. Page himself. And when you went to, to the family and you decided to make this film and they agreed, what was your sense of what you were doing at that point? What was your kind of instinctive intention in the film at the point of making? My in intention was to make a film about people who were freer than most of us, who had found a way of enjoying life that was different from the way most of us try and enjoy life. And I, I think, and I was, I was fascinated that they didn't use electricity. I mean, there was no elect drains, there was no they were completely off grid, so I was I was fascinated by that side of it, and by their engineering. I was brought up in the in a district very close to them, and um, knew farmers who had used them as threshing, you know, for threshing their corn. I'd been present at some of their threshing days, so they were and they were celebrated. They were enjoyed by the local community. They were part of the local the community. They, we must remember they weren't considered eccentrics, yes? Even though capable of imagining things and, and, and fantasizing a little bit. But uh, they were serious people. Yep. And I, I wanted to record this, some of the things which... The, I mean, I knew how, what fun it was to listen to Mr. Page talking so I wanted to record that. I, uh, he had, he has a particular way of speaking, of describing um, what he what he minds about, and what he cares about, and uh, he's very direct. He's unequivocal about what he wants um, to you know to comment on anything. He's he's he's, he's brilliant, and um, that's why I wanted to make the film, I suppose. Well, that's tremendous. And the idea of, of freedom and, and a certain way of living is absolutely central, I think, to how we're thinking about the film's importance now. We'll come back onto some of those more uh, immediate questions shortly, Philip. But, John, you are our key witness, if you like, for, the, for the, the screening of this film. You were at the Berlin premiere and you filed a review, um, a po very positive review, back in 1971. So you've seen the film, as I said in my introduction, kind of travel across this half century. 
What is your sense, again, going back to that first moment of, of encounter, what, what is your sense of the film you were seeing at that point and perhaps how it fitted into, into a sense of, of film history uh, as you were experiencing it in 1971? Well, I suppose it was rather unexpected in a way and certainly, I mean, usually the film is talked about as being basically a documentary which shows you the reality of a life. I mean, it, as I say, it's usually thought of as a documentary which just shows you the way things are. And sure, sure enough, the, the, the things it shows are rather peculiar. It does show the way things are for them, or were then. And it, it's like a glimpse into the past, well it is now a glimpse into the past, more than 50 years, and I doubt if such things, such a family, such a way of living could uh, or does exist uh, anymore anywhere in Britain. But uh, uh, all the same, the way it struck me first and still strikes me today seeing it is rather in terms of such unlikely comparisons as uh, a couple of filmmakers who I think are pretty unfashionable today. Uh, that's Jean Vigo and Jean Cocteau. Uh, Cocteau in particular it must be one of the most sophisticated of all filmmakers and his films are highly, highly sophisticated. And uh, probably much the same is true of Jean Vigo in films like Zero de Conduite and particularly La Talente. Uh, but what, so what do they have in common with The Moon and the Sledgehammer? Well, I think that they are works of poetry rather than prose. That they are put together in a way which is entirely poetic. Uh, with the, the juxtaposing of various things, the way that the pace is changed and accelerated, then diminished and accelerated. And also, I mean, right at the end, the way that after we've been living in this private universe in the middle of a forest, apparently, and so on, where we only see the family, and suddenly at the end, it's as though the camera pulls back and we see that they are living on the edge of, and indeed are part of a very different world, that they, they manage to live in both worlds. And th this too is a poetic effect, and I think that, uh, I hope you won't be embarrassed if I say that I think that Philip is one of the real few poets of the cinema. Well, thank you very much indeed, John, and absolutely to second that. And in a way, that idea of the poetic, Maxine, is something that you drew attention to as well in your conversation at Sheffield when you chose this film, you know, among just a handful uh, as, as your, your selection of desert island docks, the idea of the poetics of language, but the poetics of the life and, and the kind of the possibility of a way of being perhaps in the world. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it is, it is that, that freedom and I think that longing and it's, it is interesting as people say, oh, they're eccentrics. I grew up in sort of semi-rural uh, northwest in a town called Horwich, which is the shadow of the West Pennines. Um, and it felt to me very familiar as well, but capturing that element of people's language and I also seen as working people as not being poetic which is a big bugbear of, of mine. And actually, I th you know, as the Page family do have, y y you know, they have an, a wonderful turn of phrase and expression. Um, but also this, this sort of connection, there's, there's certain people you meet that you always feel have, they're plugged into somewhere different within the earth. They go deeper, you know what I mean? And it is obviously the surroundings make them and we're all products aren't we of our environment whatever that is uh, rural um but 
yeah, and the, the, the poetic nature of work as well, of, of that graft of, and that knowledge, that intelligence that they had. I mean, one of the highlights when I was growing up as a child was seeing Fred Dibner go past on his steam engine, you know. So this to me didn't feel, you, you, you know, it, and, and people would say eccentric, and I think that's, I'd, uh, I don't know, quite sometimes I think it's, it's used in the wrong term. It's very much, what does that mean, somebody who's eccentric? I mean, I mean, I know what it means, but sometimes it can be termed as derogatory, can't it? And I think we sometimes all crave to be eccentric in the purest form, I think. Well, sometimes one thinks that perhaps it's the world which is eccentric, peculiar, and not totally in touch with reality, and it's the family that are not eccentric, mm -hmm. that are real. Yeah, yeah. Very keen on that. Um, the other point that's important to remember, it's very difficult to live um, without electricity, trains or water supply. And the consequences of doing that is you're shaving. When you're shaving, you're shaving in the dark. There was nothing eccentric, there's nothing run down about Mr. Page. He's just living, and the rest of them are living, under the very harsh, the difficulty of living without electricity. You know, for us, it's difficult to, it's d difficult to imagine um, today what we could do without electricity. And when, when Mr. Page talks about um, all this new press-button machinery, of course, all that started... All that depends, press button machinery depends on electricity. And, it, you know, if we think about it, it's 50 years since this film was made, but it was only 50 years before that that electricity began to get into houses. There's a, so it's 100 years since electricity began, 50 years since Moon Sledgehammer was built, was, was made. And um, it gives you, you know, we're much closer to no electricity or then we think and when mr page talks about getting giddy and once you're up the halfway up the ladder and he's talking about the press button machinery getting too confusing for us all and today i think we are quite confused by the amount of electricity that we're using and how we're using it we've not yet understood about it nor have we understood what the consequences could be of, you know, everybody with a handpiece, everybody doing a lot of things remotely. I think there's quite a lot in what he says about going to the moon, which relates to that. No, thank you all very much indeed. And you're absolutely, absolutely right, Philip. I mean, the, the idea that, 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 that John raised, that of course this is something we would find hard to imagine being able to continue now. And yet at the same time, we find ourselves, if you like, as I suggested at the beginning, coming full circle, we, we see a larger number of people moving or hoping to move off grid. We see communities, you know, of course, where they can afford land and property to finding ways to, to live and work collectively. We see Extinction Rebellion, which obviously advocates for uh, much of this as well. Maxine, you, you're, a, you know, you're renowned for your commitment, your engagement politically and socially. This also is a, you know, a, a poetic engagement, as you said just now. I mean, do you see this film as something that can, can be used, if you like, practically and, and poetically as, a, as a, a kind of tool, a proposal for the future, as much as a, a register of the past? Definitely. And it, it just feel like a man, you know, they do have a, a, a manifesto, don't they? And it feels so very current. And, you know, we're sat here 50 years later, and of course, it's a magnificent film. But also, it's, it's not just that, is it? It feels it's still it's still a warning of the future. What they're tell saying in 71, as people did, you know, decades before, was, you know, this, this, the, the warning of, of if we continue this way of what humans will do to the planet. And we still aren't learning, or we're learning very slowly and we're moving very slowly. But I think this, th this film is a very stark reminder in that way from the, this philosophy of these people that... Like I say, on the surface, people could judge and say uneducated, which is a nonsense, you know what I mean? When you are so connected to the land, you understand it. It's inherent, isn't it? They have an empathy with their environment that surpasses 
any sort of uh, intellectual in, in intelligence in that way. But yeah, I think very much this is a film that will move on and on. And um, and when I sort of said, oh yes, I'd love to come and, and talk about it, very kindly got sent a big box of DVDs, which then I dished out to friends who hadn't seen it. And, and just the fact that they were like, sorry, is this, when was this released? And I was like, oh, this, no, it's the 50 years. And and just how inspired they felt by it and 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 sort of mind blown by the the, the subject matter and also the you know what 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 the film was talking about what so yeah i think you know if we're still around in another 50 years this film will will last and move forward but it's it's something we need you know it should be on the school syllabus i think <laughs> Absolutely, along with much else that is uh, ignored completely by the structures. Uh, hopefully, a steam-powered screening, of course, in the future. <laughs> you know, um, in a post -ele post-electric world. Um, Philip, there are inevitably, of course, as you know from many previous events like this, a, a, a series of questions that people will ask, and, and they have asked um, in the questions put forward in advance. And I'll try and just gather them all together in a way, but you you know what they are uh, in, in all sorts of ways. The relationships uh, b between the family members. The, the absence of, of the mother or the wife? Yeah, the absence of mother is... I mean, there are lots of faults in the film, major faults. One of them is no reference, no spoken reference to the mother. And the mother was a strong character, a, a strong but believer in the Old Testament teachings. And you have to remember that when manual workers are working, they don't have much time to read. And so one book is probably the best. You, you know, they'll know the one book more than they will ten books, let's put. And uh, so the Bible was, was her Bible. There is a reference to her in the B scene, because Mr. Page is carefully unwrapped by his daughter, taking his clothes are taken off. He's going to visit the bees. And you communicate with bees if you've lost a close friend or dear wife. And that's what was going on there. And he did tell me that that's what he did. So she is there. But it, it is sad that she's not mentioned because she must have been very influential. Yeah. And as, as the film unfolds, I mean, we see the, the world of, of the family and, uh, and their landscape, you know, established beautifully. And then, of course, in the, in the final third of the film, we start to hear from the children and obviously for Mr. Page himself, about what each thinks of the other. Yeah. And you become a kind of confessional for them. Now, that was something that just evolved over, over the course of filming. They started to trust you, each of them in their own way. Um, or was it something you sought out as part of what you were hoping to do from the beginning? What do you mean? What in terms of how they, how they are very open with you about what they think of, of, of him, the children, and what he thinks of them. He's, he's very candid with you, and, and they are equally with you. Yeah, I, I, f I find as I get older, I'm quite candid about my own children, much more so than I was when I was younger. I'm not, you know, I'm not afraid to say what I think about them and to tell them straight. Yeah, but I think it's to do with old age. Right. A lot, do a they tell them, uh, tell you what they think of you with equal thank? Oh, they do. <laughs> and I can tell you, there's no doubt about that. Either. Yeah. I mean, in a sense, that, that idea of the relationships that are discussed, you know, does lead on to the questions of, you know, inevitably, 50 years on, of what comes after, you know, how the land um, uh, has, has remained or not in, in the family, um, what happened to them, marriages, relationships beyond the film. What is your, what, what is your uh, um, awareness of the family in, in the years following? Well, uh, the, the, the Ron is unmentioned in the film. He's on the back of the traction engine at the end. Mm. Peter, as he said, would not work on this old Fowler engine, but Ron would. And Ron was the eldest eldest son. He lived um, about five miles away from the wood on the edge of a town and was a good engineer and happily married and settled down. And um, his descendants, his uh, niece, uh, it's the niece of the family, I think, of Mr. Um, granddaughter of Mr. Page, who's in the in 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 the cottage at the moment, and it's been cleaned up and smartened up a little bit. But I think it's still off grid, as far mm. as I know. Yeah. There are there are some wonderful questions here and, and comments. I'll just read a couple, if I may, from Catherine. My grandmother lived in the bungalow at the top of the lane. I remember as a child, fifty-four now, 
It was part of Mr. Ticehurst's farm. I remember the steamroller men walking down the lane as a child. I found them scary, covered in coal, but now I realize they were a lovely family. And it turns out that the steam engines are both still working. And I think the Alchin one is, uh, uh, as Katie has annotated here, appearing at steam shows in Ireland with a big banner saying, as appeared in the moon and the sledgehammer. Wonderful. So, so that's tremendous, right, isn't it? I mean, that really is. Mm. But the sense of, of, uh, of, I think it's really important, which all of you have mentioned in different ways, is that the, they are not, you know, a, an anomaly at that point in the culture. They might be a bridge between stages of how we are living or were living at that point, but they are not uh, marginalised and, and so on. I mean, now for you, Philip, that, that idea of the, of the community and how of a family like that and how you would approach them. I mean, this was not your first film. You've made a number of very distinctive films. But would you, if you were making films still, would you feel an ability to approach a family like that in the culture that we find ourselves in now, where, you know, the kind of, the sort of, the, the looking at, at each uh, each other, the, the the kind of close awareness that we have from technology, is very, it's very different. Do you think you could find a family like that now? There's some people in Stockton I'd love to make a film about mm -hmm. tomorrow. They run a, uh, a casting factory up in Stockton. And there, you know, I've got to know them a, a lot because we make tools in Yorkshire and they do all the casting for us. So I know these people very well. I would like one day to make a little film about them. And they're, they're, again, covered in black dust <laughs> and uh, eccentric, some of them. But uh, no, th so I, I would like to make more films. Mm. Can, can I ask you something else, which is about Mr. Page? Am I right in remembering that he had in his time been a professional performer, that he'd been in a circus or something? Yeah, like he that? was indeed. There was a traveling circus came round, and he was part of that. Yeah, he would, um, when he wasn't thrashing corn or or something, yeah, he was definitely part of the circus. Yeah, that's where he met his kangaroos and lions and 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 monkeys. And was wearing a gas mask, pretending to be an elephant. At one stage. Yes, indeed, he was demonstrating how they how they walk with their how they bend their knees, bend like ours do. <laughs> Could we just think again a little bit about about it as a film? Because it mm. is a really remarkable film, and seeing it again on, on such a wonderful projection, I was really struck by, by, by your assembly, by the careful, patient eye you brought to the landscape, by the really ecological sense of how you put the film together. We're very aware that they and everything around and about them is part of the larger landscape. I mean, it becomes a kind of ecological manifesto, you know, well ahead of the of the game, if, if you like. Yeah. But, but again, just what was your what was your... Your, your, to, to the very small crew you had, what was the sense of, of, of how that they would be with the family and with the landscape? I mean, they feel, you feel you're very up close a lot of the time, but also at the same time, they carry on very much as they would, we imagine, if you weren't there. Well, they wouldn't have known how close we were photographing. No, of course. Them. No. And, uh, no, I, I mean, I, it w perhaps wouldn't be more difficult to make a film today as closely, as close, but... It did. It's all about making a, a real friend. You know, they were our real friends, and uh, all the crew who were brilliant. Yeah, you know, I had a wonderful cameraman and wonderful sound recorders, and very assi good assistant cameraman. You know, it was it was a good crew, and then a very useful editor at the end. So you know, I was well assisted, and the producer who managed to sort of think get the money out of the National Film Corporation. Very important. It all came together, uh, and, and we're, we're obviously enormously glad it did. Now, Maxine, you know, in a couple of weeks, you, you mentioned uh, before we came on um, that you're about to shoot a film, uh, your, your own next film, um, as, as director, as filmmaker. And, and we were talking a little bit again about what, what you mentioned earlier, about this idea of the poetic, of what, what kind of register is allowed to certain people in certain classes. And this, of course, as you said, is a great example of, of allowing everybody the fullest expression of their being. Now, this has been a very influential film on a number of British filmmakers and, and beyond. And, and in a sense, if you're thinking about a film, it, it has a film. Would it be a document that you, again, would feel that you could circulate as, as, a, as a means and a way of making work in the way that you would hope to 
aspire to and advocate for. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting because we, we said, you know, I know we say documentary, don't we? And it is a documentary, but it, like you say, it's, it's, it's bigger than that, isn't it? And the way it's... Um, but yeah, very much, this is a big, I mean, I've, I've done, I'm, I'm about to make a short, I've done one short film before, no? it's cool. but um, you know, a big influence on how I would look and how you would want to work. And I think how now as British filmmakers, I mean, I'm not casting myself in that, that group at the moment, but just looking from a performer, how we can get this kind of, you know, these kind of films made now it's very difficult it's very difficult to get funding but looking at something so beautiful and you know as as Philip said on a, a small crew small cast yeah you know small cast of of, of subjects it, it does feel we can still take inspiration from the moon and the sledgehammer I, I, you know um to get things made and get those stories out that maybe the big Financiers don't seem interested to the detriment. Mm -hmm. Don't seem interested in as much anymore. You know, it seems a real struggle. The more interesting ideas I get sent from people, I think, wow, and they go, well, the thing is, I can't get. You know, it's very difficult to get. F uh, you know, funding, but uh, I think maybe we have to. Yeah, there's a new evolution of, you know, where to make films now, and it's yeah. I don't know. I don't know. We should have an answer properly. No, no, it's yeah. wonderful. I mean, it's, it's absolutely an example, I think, you know, of, of how to make and obviously what is made, you know, with that with that process. John, just before we open it out to the audience, again, just, just coming back to your sense of it in, in you know, in, in the tradition of filmmaking, um, I think elsewhere you've spoken about it as um, being a bridge, if you like, from, from post-war documentary through to contemporary documentary at the, t at the time of its making. There seemed to be, alongside the French influences you described, there seemed to be Soviet influences in a certain heroic uh, filming of, of, of the family. We, we have a, a sense, again, of that, that kind of almost surreal, surrealist tradition of, of the close-up in certain ways, things becoming other. And, and and so for you filmically, it obviously still matters as well as, of course, the, you know the 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 content thematics and 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 the intention of it as as a work. Well, uh, as well as thinking about uh, Cocteau and a poetic tradition of filmmaking, I was also in an odd way thinking about Eisenstein and all his ideas of editing. The film is not edited in the way that Eisenstein would recognize, but in a funny way it's put together, like a piece of Eisenstein editing, or like a mosaic, I should say, perhaps, where you have little blocks of film which are put together into a pattern which uh, works by, as I was saying before, by Hold it tight, speeding John. and slowing and so on. So, <laughs> yeah. so I think that's, uh, uh, I mean, very si significant in terms of this, as you just said, as a sort of bridge between the uh, documentaries of the war years and so on. And also, I, there's someone that I didn't mention that I suddenly think of now, Humphrey Jennings who was another poet who made films yeah. and uh, whose films become like poems. I mean, uh, uh, Jennings was, of course, a painter as well as a poet and um, a, a contributor to the big surrealist exhibition in the 1930s. So all these things come together and I think much the same combination of things. A lot of the effect of uh, the moon and the sledgehammer is is quite surreal. Um, and that is an effect which is often produced uh, not by departing from reality, but by, mo but by moving so close into reality that it becomes something else. It becomes unreal or super real and uh, I think that was in that way uh, the moon and the sledgehammer was a pointer to uh, a certain very elite band 
of films and filmmakers that followed on from it in, in the next 50 years. Incredible to think that it is 50 years, but here we all are still, and I think, if anything, the film grows more impressive the longer we have to contemplate it. Absolutely, yeah, very well, very well said. Well, uh, I've completely lost track of time, perhaps suitably, given the film, um, but also massively unhelpfully. I've no idea how long we have left. Um, but I'd love to hear from any or all of you, well, perhaps not all of you, um, but any of you, should you wish to um, uh, raise any further questions. Yes, yes please, so, yeah, please project. Thank you. Well, after Mr. Page died, I, w I w visited the sisters who'd moved out, Nancy, who was the one with the needlework, she had a boyfriend up the road who had a big house, huge house. And uh, you know, that's another part of the story. And she, she inherited that house, but it was far too big for her. And so she went to the council and the council took it. She gave it to the council. She got a little small house. So when the, um, they moved out of the wood, Cathy and uh, Jim and... Nancy lived together. Actually, Jim was not allowed to live with them when he stayed on in the wood. And as did Peter, the two brothers actually sad, had a, came to a sad end. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any more questions? I think we might be heading towards the end of the formal time. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, he, was, he did a lot. Yeah, he was very, very important. I argued with Jimmy a great deal, so um, he was very keen on a sort of more cinema verite style than I was. He came, you know, he'd worked, he'd worked with uh, Mr. Rogerson, who was very keen on uh, an American filmmaker, who who was keen on cinema verite. I, and I wasn't that keen on it, that kind of thing. Anyway, we we did have lots of battles, but the great thing about Jimmy was he got the money, promised to distribute the film, and we wouldn't have got the money if I had started to get the money through the National Film Finance Corporation. By, you know, I was interviewed by them, but he came in with... Um, he'd, he'd taken an earlier film of mine and distributed it, and, uh, and he said, I will do this one as well. And it, it, uh, there wasn't much story, there wasn't much preparation. Just th that I'd made other films. Yeah, and, and he took it, took it on. He was very brave. How did the film get to the Berlin Film Festival, of all places? That was I mean, I think it's wonderful that it did, yeah. but I'm also rather surprised that it did. That was Jimmy. Was that Jimmy? The, entirely Jimmy. He was importing and distributing wonderful, inventive, alternative films from America and anybody here that made one. He had a whole collection of wonderful films, uh, anthropological films and, and uh, Kenneth Anger films and then... Uh, oh, Come on, uh, the American. Uh, come, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol thank you, <laughs> <laughs> and so on. You know, he, had a, he, I mean, he had a he had a, a nest of wonderful filmmakers, and yeah, so he could he, he had the power to to um, the leverage really to get the film onto into, into the cinemas. Thank you very, very much indeed. Yeah, and probably the last question there. Yes, please. Thank you. Just to repeat that, so reception of the film at the time and then influence onwards uh, into other filmmakers. I, it blew, I think it blew people's minds, honestly. And and it was the eccentricity of it was was the eccentricity of the people sort of surprised them, I think. And, and you know, it had a big effect, I think, on... Um, yeah. I mean, just in terms of the, some of the filmmakers we know, of course, who've spoken publicly about it, whether it's Andrew Cotting, Ben Rivers, Molly Deneen, Kim Longinotto, Nick Broomfield, all key makers in the 
you know, in the expanded documentary tradition in the UK. And those are just, you know, a handful of the British makers. So, you know, it really has, you know, really kind of pushed its its influence into all sorts of other bodies of work which have taken, uh, you know, some of those lessons on in, uh, in their own distinctive and equally singular ways, I think. So it's a really key work, you know. It and Something, I, I did work with Paul Watson just for one moment when we were at college. I was uh, worked as an assistant sound man on a film that he made when we were at college, the Royal College, and uh, it was working in a pub. I went on to make a film about a pub, <laughs> thanks to that experience. So I was influenced by him for a, mo a moment. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not a spy on the wall. I, di I didn't like spy on the wall films much. That's trying to sort of get to the nitty gritty truth which didn't doesn't go down with me mm. and it, that's where he became he became a specialist in that fly on the wall as i remember thank you very much indeed well i think it's clear that obviously key people are, have been involved both in the production the circulation the exhibition and the onward um, obviously the onward uh, manifestation of this film, no, not least Katie, as I said at the beginning, all those people, key individuals, often within uh, problematic structures, making such work available to us. So many, many thanks to everyone along the way who's made The Moon and the Sledgehammer continue to have the impact that it has, of course, up until this screening today. And of course, let's not forget the screening going on, pretty much just finishing now, up uh, on the banks of the Clyde, of course, um, in Glasgow. So tremendous to have that uh, simultaneously unfolding uh, this evening. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Please do look at themoonandthesledgehammer.com. Sign up to the newsletter and, and uh, track down the DVD, of course, as I mentioned just now. Many thanks to everyone at Picture House for making it possible, particularly upstairs now in the projection. Wonderful projection tonight. Thank you very much indeed, everyone here in the room, front of house and so on. But of course, huge thanks to everyone on stage with me. John Russell Taylor, Maxine Peake, and of course, Philip Trevelyan. Thank you very much.